All right, welcome to episode 24 of Seize the Moment podcast, and today we have a very special guest. And so today we have on Napoleon of the Outlaws. Napoleon is a multi-platinum selling artist and a former member of Tupac Shakur's hip-hop group, The Outlaws. And we're so happy to have him on. And so for me, it means a lot because I was like the, one of the biggest Napoleon fans ever. And I've been a fan of Napoleon since the early 2000s. And I just want to say thank you so, so much for coming on, man. Man, the pleasure is all mine, man. The pleasure is mine, bro. Appreciate it. You're very welcome, man. And so Napoleon just recently released a really great documentary that I watched. I think it was about two to three weeks ago. So Napoleon's documentary is called Life of an Outlaw. And so Napoleon, yes. can you tell us a little bit about your documentary and how come you chose now to release it? The documentary, um, Life of an Outlaw, we actually, you know, we did the documentary a few years back. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike, Mike Epps is the executive producer. Um, it took some time to put everything together because we had to get the approval from the uh, Fanny Shakur personally signed us the approval with the estate. Uh, we had to get a, all the approval letters from everyone. And it took some time to release it, man, because the music industry, after I walked away from the industry, I had to change with, and be more concerned about the way I release um, anything that I'm involved in. So I had a few options where people wanted to put the documentary out in the past but they was like you know what we want to once we sign this contract with you we gonna have rights to add what we want in the documentary take out of the documentary so that kind of made me skeptical yeah. once one company came at me like that i'm like man you must be crazy mm -hmm. you know what i mean you must around have some crazy scenes up in there that i'm trying to get away from so it took some time man and we we, we got together with a good friend of mine steve lobel who used to be the manager of the outlaws he hooked us up with his homeboy jared who has a company you know, what I mean, my partner, Yusuf in Canada, met with Jared, spoke to him a couple times over the phone. And he was like, look, man, I think you guys have something good. Um, if you give me a couple months, I'm going to see what I can do to, get, to release it. And he came through. You know what I mean? So it took some time. But, it, you know, as we say, everything happened at, for, at the right time, man. Everything happened at the perfect time. You yeah. Know? yeah, man. And so can you, tell yeah. Us, can you tell us about your start in hip hop? How did you get into the industry? Man, I got into the industry. Well, you know, as a young kid growing up in Irvington, New Jersey, man, I, I, I pretty much started writing when I was about 12, um, maybe earlier, you know what I mean? But I started writing my my early teenage years. Whatever I would see outside of my block, I would go back and rap it for the drug dealers, for the gangsters in my neighborhood, which majority of them was my family members. Yeah. And they would start paying me for it, you know what I mean? So I knew at a young age, I always had a business mindset. So when I start, when I got my first, I think 50 cents or a quarter, 25 cents for, back then it was a lot of money, you know what I mean? <laughs> I knew that I could turn this into a business, but I had my passion, I always had passion for writing, you know what I mean? So eventually I got back in contact with Gaddafi, who was Jafeo, Gaddafi, his mother and some family friends, family members of mine were very close friends, you know? And I used to go to his neighborhood, like I used to go to Gaddafi house every year because our birthdays is a couple of days apart. So his mother would come get me every year around the same time and take me to his house and I would spend a couple of days with him. Years went past, I lost, I lost contact with him. My cousin ran into his mother and she said, how was Yafeo doing? And she said, you know, Yafeo was trying to rap with his brother Tupac Shakur. And you know, my cousin said the same thing about me and that's how we got back together, man. And ever since then it was on, you know, Pac came to New York um, not too long after that. And I was able to hop on the train with my brother my brother Siki and we went to New York and it was on ever since that day you know what I mean yeah what was it like meeting him that first time Tupac you know as a youngster especially as a young a, a youngster and, and my my set of my state of mind at that particular time and I was raw like even though I was young in age maybe 14 15 years old 13 maybe 14 13 but I was raw because I was straight from the block man the way I live my mm. life every day I go home from school I would go straight on my block and I would hang and I, everybody out there selling drugs, people getting beat up, people getting shot. This was my life. So I thought when I met, you know, I said when I meet Tupac, from what I know from his music, he's a gangster rapper or whatever. And, you know, he's always in the, the news and the media. <laughs> I had to impress him, man. I want to I want to let him know I'm from the hood. But I was surprised that he wasn't really with that type of stuff. You know, Pac was out of his time man. he wasn't really with none of that negative stuff like the media try to portray him to be. So when I started coming at him like that, he kind of pretty much put me in my place. Like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm ser a serious person. You know what I mean? So I knew right there that he was only dealing with people that he felt is going to not be a negative impact around him. But he, he his whole idea was he wanted to be a positive impact on myself, the outlaws, we was younger than him, you know what I mean? So he wasn't really with that type of stuff, man. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> and so, and, and so when, you were young, when you were younger and you were studying hip-hop and poetry, and before you even got into the business, who were some rappers who inspired you and your work? 
you know what, man? I always back then. I love West Coast rappers. It's, mm-hmm. it's Ajib. It's strange. Ajib is an Arabic word for strange. My bad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's strange because I didn't really levitate towards um, East Coast rappers, even though there was. A, it's a lot of East Coast rappers that are hot. Not taking nothing away from them, but the ones that I did levitate or used to listen to back then, they was all East Coast rapper that had like, for example, Cool G Rap, Eric mm-hmm. B and Rakim. Like it had to have a gangster message undertone to it. I couldn't listen to like a hip hop, that type of stuff, man. They had so that's why I always love West Coast rap. And I think, you know, when I look back at the reason why I was always into that type of music because it was the life that I was seeing every day of my life, walking outside of my house, coming home from school. I was seeing that type of lifestyle. So I was always intrigued to it. My first rap that I ever wrote, man, it was called Money and Murder. Hmm. Me and my friend, a, a, a cousin of mine's Greg Rabby helped write the hook for me where I'm 13, 14 years old and my hook was like, money got me feeling like a star, but murder got me feeling like my death ain't far. Mm -hmm. I'm 13 years old, 14 years old with these type of bars, you know what I mean? Because Mm -hmm. that's all I saw growing up. Yeah, did you feel like music saved you? Like, especially in kind of the context of where you grew up? I feel, I feel at that time, even though now as an older individual who accepted the religion of Islam, I don't listen to music, um, but I really believe I wouldn't say music saved me in general. Of course, everything is from God, but I think by Pac giving me a chance, yeah. I would say by Pac giving me a chance, it actually saved me from a lot, you know, because when I walked away from my neighborhood and became affiliated with Tupac and I moved in with him, every single one of my family members was in and out of jail after that. They all went to prison. Some of them got shot. Some of them got killed. Yeah. So I can look back at it and say, man, what would I would have been doing if I was out there with him? So. I thank Pop for that, for giving me that opportunity. Yeah. I, no. Uh, uh, what made you want to convert to Islam? Or, or what about Islam spoke to you? I think, you know, um, I grew up with, a, like most Americans, we have, a, we have a distorted understanding of the religion of Islam. You know, I mm. grew up thinking that all Muslims, like the people that killed my mother and father was affiliated with the nation of Islam. So I grew up thinking all Muslims are murderers and killers and the media doesn't help you know the media portrays Islam in a negative impact but when I went through the music industry and I went through my days of success I felt empty inside you know what I mean I was very unhappy oh, and wow. it was a particular time of my life every time a brand new car would come I'll be able to get that joint I'm living in gated communities in the, uh, California four or five bedroom homes but I was very depressed and I was unhappy and I'm the type of person man that I had to say man it had to be more than life than just drinking and smoking and partying it have to be something else like i wanted i wanted something for my soul and that's what islam gave me you know what i mean mm. how come you think that sort of fame and fortune is such a big trap for people how come you think, I think because a good question man i think because a lot of us you know natural it's it's natural for the soul of mankind to lean towards like a lot of stuff that's not good for us unfortunately the soul it levitates and it leans towards things that's harmful for us, things that might not be good for us. It's, it, and that's why it's difficult to stay away from these things. It's, it's more harder to try to live a right life. It's easier to live a crazy, corrupt, bad life because everything is surrounded. It's easy to get our hands on that. And I think fame, it can be misleading for a lot of people because most of the people that get involved in some type of industry that might bring them fame or money or whatever, they go there thinking that that's going to be their ultimate savior, that that's going to bring them their happiness. That's going to bring them, that's going to change their lives, you know what I mean? Because the way that America or Hollywood, for example, portray that lifestyle, they make it look unfallible from the outside looking in. But when you get involved in that lifestyle, you realize that it might be more problems in that lifestyle, you know what I mean? It might be more problems with fame, you know, because now most famous people, and now we have this with social media, man, you have to live up to an image. Yeah. You know what I mean? So you have to live up to the image and you got to be, you got to be a slave to what other people think about you. And that comes with fame. You can't really, majority of the people can't be themselves, you know what I mean? So naturally, you will be unhappy living a life that way. Yeah, I mean, it's been argued that some people even commit suicide because they can't live up to their image or want to, don't even want to try to and don't know how to escape it. Exactly, man. I didn't feel freedom to, like, I, I'm happy that I'm living in Saudi Arabia. I can throw a throw one with some slippers and ain't nobody going to be like, look, what's on his feet? You know what I mean? Are no paparazzi out there? <laughs> huh? No paparazzi out there? No paparazzi, <laughs> and, and, and if it is, they're not looking at your feet because everybody, a man, the same guy that work, probably is worth a hundred million dollars, or the same guy that's worth a hundred dollars, they all dress the same out here. Yeah, you know what I mean, for sure. There's something <laughs> beautiful about that, actually. There, there's you guys nice. have to come, man. Come visit. <laughs> That'd be really cool, man. Yeah, it's I won't a... get kidnapped. Don't worry. Not... <laughs> <laughs> don't, be, don't believe the media, man. <laughs> 
<laughs> Do you want to ask you know, something? Uh, yeah, no, it's like, yeah, with people seeking fame, it's because they think that something outside of themselves, something external is going to bring them happiness. But a lot of yeah. times, yeah, it looks like people come to that realization. The people who realize this, it's like it's something inside or it's some kind of exactly. connection to something greater that, you know, I, brings I you that happiness. You. Yeah. I agree with you, my man. I, that's that's the reality of it. You know what I mean? They look for fame, and, and when they feel, we realize that fame is not really the answer, a lot of people get depressed. A lot of people don't know how to deal with it. You know, I went through that. I'm on. I'm, I, I can vouch that I went through that. Like, I had three houses at one time, and I go to sleep like, how come I have this, but I don't have any inner happiness, no inner peace. I'm depressed. I'm unhappy. I gotta drink a half. A, I gotta drink so much cups of Hennessy a day just to feel. Like this, just to get by in life, you know what I mean? And that's not the way, you know, that's not a healthy mindset mentally, physically. It's not a good, you know, place to be in, you know? Yeah. And what was so awesome about you is that, like, even when you guys were at sort of the peak of the music industry or just celebrity in general, that you can write, like, these really genuine songs, man. And so the song that touched me from you the most was off the Outlaw Still I Rise album, You Can Be Touched, where you took Pac's yeah, yeah, old yeah. verse and you kind of shifted yeah. it into your life. And it was like, wow, holy shit, man. Like, these guys. A lot are... of people don't know. See, a lot of people don't know. And that song, actually, Pac wrote that song yeah. first for me and told me to do it. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time, you know, as rappers, we don't want nobody to write anything for it, but that's Pac, you know. I mean, so who gonna argue about that? You yeah. know what I mean? When Pac wrote that verse, as soon as he got out the booth, he's like, Move, man, that verse sound like everything I said in that verse sound like you should be saying it. You know what I mean? So please go back in there. I want you to say it just sound like it's coming from you. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I think um, you know what I mean, it resonated with the people because when you think about it, it pretty much was my life and that's how I felt, you know. And Pac was good with reading people, you know? Yeah. And so how come you think that that message was so important for people to let them know that no matter what, that they were never going to be so high that they're invincible? I think because that's the majority of the people need to hear that message, man. I think um, majority of people can resonate, a message like that will resonate with people no matter their color, their race, their religion. You know what I mean? Just it's a, it's a, it's a simple message, but it hits home. You feel me? Yeah. It can touch people all over the world where they can realize, because it's a positive message, you know, mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Yeah. And so even though you kind of switched over and you know, you, so you obviously haven't been in the music industry for, I think, about over a decade at this point. Do you still look back yeah. on some of your older songs and still think that the message is important for people to hear? Well, for me, because of my personal beliefs, now, I don't listen to music at all. Yeah. You know what I mean? I don't listen to music. Um, of course, sometimes I, I, I will forget, like, you know, a person will come up to me and be like, you was on this song and I forget that I was on that song, you know? <laughs> yeah. But recently, not too long ago, as you mentioned on your um, Instagram page, I did poetry. I got back into poetry because in the religion of Islam, poetry is something that always been part of the culture, you know what I mean? So I think I'll continue to do poetry without music and stuff like that and just try to put that message out, a positive message, you know? Yeah. And hey, how come poetry is so important? Poetry has always been part of the, the culture of Islam especially Arabia, like tribes used to actually, it's crazy, <laughs> tribes in Arabia, pre-Islamic tribes used to have poetry battles. <laughs> wow! <laughs> with this tribe, yeah, cool. with, this tribe yeah. with this with this tribe, with this this tribe, and all a war would break out, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Because the Adas was known, like if you, me studying the Arabic language is a very eloquent language, it's, it's, it's like one word can have about 20, 30 different meanings, you know what I mean? It, it's a very deep language, so the Arabs in that time used to be prideful on how they put their words. So that's why when the Quran got revealed, the Quran, a lot of verses in the Quran, it rhymes. Yeah. Because it rhymes, but it was talking about, it was verses from God. So it took the Arabs, they was like, man, it sounds like poetry, but the message behind it is something amazing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So poetry, and even if you look at rap, like a lot of people, I have a friend of mine from Philadelphia who did some research, some um, research for years. And he came to the conclusion that rap, was passed down from poetry from the African slave, the Muslims, the Muslim African slaves who came from West Africa. They passed down poetry to poetry until it got to the English language and it, start, it started being something that the black community kept. That's why rap me rhythm and poetry. You know what I mean? So it, it's amazing. When he broke it down to me, it was amazing to see that it still went back to some of the roots we shared, that I shared. You know what I mean? Yeah. And was poetry itself at that time during those days sort of, was it used to bring people together like warring tribes? Yes, the, the the poetry in those days would bring people together, or it would break them apart. Yeah. <laughs> it would it would make a war. The same way with <laughs> rap. The same way. The same way with hip hop. You yeah. Know what I mean? You know what I mean? It's pride. It's pride that you know what I mean. Like you say something, and 
it's crazy how a person would let words get to them, you know what I mean? To the point where we seen that with the East Coast, West Coast. At the end of the day, it was all it was just pride that got in the way that could have caused that caused a lot of people to not even be here to this day. And I, it's crazy because I was watching an interview yesterday um, with BG Knockout and Vlad, you know what I mean? And they talked about that, how pride is the main reason why most people, especially in the inner cities of America, kill somebody or get killed, you know what I mean? And when you look at poetry, like we just mentioned, the tribes that used to beef with each other in pre-Arabia, it was all pride. Yeah. This this tribe say something it, against this tribe, all of a sudden they bring the swords out. How you say this about me? Uh -huh. <laughs> Y'all ain't got no love for Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg? <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. What, what was the East Coast, West Coast beef like from your perspective at the time? I think... Um, you know, looking back at it, man, it really was... It, the media blew it out of proportion. Yeah. Uh, it never really was an East Coast, West Coast beef. It was difficult for certain individuals to come to the East Coast and West Coast. It was difficult for some people, but Pac originally from New York. We are from New Jersey. You yeah. know what I mean? Okay. Um, the West Coast, you know, Pac, a lot of people always say, well, Pac is not really from the West Coast, but Pac had a lot of love for the West Coast because when he was 13, 14, 15 years old, maybe, he went to Oakland. Mm -hmm. And that's the that's that and that age right there is a very important sensitive age when you're a young teenager because you're being groomed by the environment that's around you. You know what I mean? So Tupac, his grooming came from when he moved to Oakland, California, is when he felt like he started to get game as a young man. Before that, he had no people, no older people in his life beside the Black Panthers, and majority of the Black Panther men were in prison. So Pac had to be raised by women. But when he went to Oakland, it was the first time in his life that people from the streets were stepping up to him, giving him game, saying, this is how we move. This is So that's why he always represented the West Coast, because he lived there since he was 15 years old. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so, and what was Pac like for you? Like, what was your personal relationship like with him? And did his persona differ in reality, kind of in the interpersonal relationships between you guys, you, him, and the outlaws? I think Pac... Um, he, he was the same, no matter what yeah. you see on television, his personality was the same. Um, we definitely had a close relationship, I, you know what I mean? I was the one dude out of the outlaws that I would mouth back with Pac, and I think he liked that, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Because he would come in the room and scream, we all respected him, that's a big brother to us, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? That was like our big brother, but I was the type of person that I would mouth off. Mm -hmm. He would say something to me, i say it back. And, um, <laughs> and I was say, like, you know what? Like. And, and, and you know what was crazy? I always think about this. When he first got shot, um, when he first got shot in New York City, yeah. we used to sit around his house. He was in Jasmine Guy House, his actress lady. He used to sit around. Mm -hmm. He was shot up, you know what I mean? So he'd sit on the couch, and we'd just be sitting in the house for hours. And we started joking on each other. And when I used to joke back then, I used to get like mad, like a young. And I used to be, I used to be a very mean person. Yeah. So I used to try to, I used to try to say stuff to dig in their chest, like to really hurt an <laughs> individual. So. I said a joke because it was a time that early 96, I forget what part of Africa, it might have been Ethiopia, we had turned on the news and we kept seeing like people in that part of Africa throwing rocks at the police and, and Pac, he looked like he could be African, like a real African. So I said, man, I don't even think, I, I said to him, I was like, and I really tried to hurt him, I was like, man, I don't even think you really got shot, man, you were African and you got hit with rocks all over your body. Oh, you dirty damn. African. And he started laughing. <laughs> like, <laughs> while he shot up and I'm joking with him about being shot, he started laughing. <laughs> And I think from that day on, he probably was like, this dude mindset is a little different, but I love it. You know what I mean? Because I was always around myself to him, and I'll always be back. But I knew my limits because he was my big brother. He was a person that I respected. So I knew when to say, you know what, let me shut my mouth now. You know what yeah. I mean? I think it went too far. And I remember one time I tried to wrestle him. Like, for some reason, <laughs> like, you know, when you, were, when you were a young teenager, for some reason, you think you could take on anybody. Yeah. And I remember, like, Pot used to look skinny to me. And I remember mousing <laughs> off with him. We was at a trailer in one of, one of the movies. And then we got into, like, a little tussle. We started wrestling. And I realized how strong he was. So after that, I had to start adjusting the way I, you know, come at him. <laughs> wow. Because he put me, he kind of hurt at me, but he let me know, like, look, I'm just playing with you, but you better be careful. <laughs> <laughs> You know what I mean? And so what were the early days of the Outlaws like? What was it like when I guess you guys put the group together? You know, the Outlaws, uh, we went through different stages. The beginning, we was young thugs. And that was myself. When I first came around, for example, it was Edie, mm -hmm. Castro, and Gaddafi. They was a group called Young Thugs. Yeah. When I first came around, I wanted to be a little more solo artists. I just wanted to, like, that's what I wanted to do. You know what I mean? Be a solo artist. 
And one day we went into the studio, Pac was in New York, we went to the studio in New York and we got on a song with him. Excuse me, I got on a song with him and it was dope. And Pac was like, man, that's dope. That's what I want to hear. And he was like, man, I'm putting you in a group. And I remember I was mad, like, damn, man, I want to I wanna be solo, you know? <laughs> And then we went from the Young Thugs to Dry Messiah, Dry Messiah yeah. which was just us four. And after that, we did an album on Interscope. Um, actually, the album on Interscope was mainly myself, Edie, and um, Castro. Gaddafi, I don't know what happened. I think he got into a fight or argument with Pac and didn't want to go to the studio or something like that. Yeah. Then not too long after Tupac got arrested, and that's when he called. He was like, you know what? I'm releasing y'all from Interscope Records. I'm going to Death Row Records. And he's like, man, I'm putting together a group called Outlaw Immortals. Yep. And that's when that's the beginning of the Outlaw days, you know? Yeah. Damn, man. What stories? Uh, what, uh, what made you want to become a, a motivational speaker? I think, you know, it, it kind of happened naturally, bro. You know, after I left the music industry, I just had opportunities to go sit down with some youth, travel around the world, and just speak with the people. I just feel like... You know, for me, it's easy like that. I can just be around some people I don't really know, and I just start talking to them, and you know what I mean? And so for me, it was natural. You know, the people came, and, you know, people invited me to say, would you come speak to the, the youth? You know, I was surprised to see, you know, that many people on an international level who used, who looked up to us. You know, growing up, we never realized the impact that our music had back then. So yeah. for me to have an opportunity to go sit back to the go talk to the people and explain why we said certain words, why we behaved a certain way and try to tell them don't make the same mistakes that we made, you know what I mean? So I enjoy it. Yeah, and so what I really loved about your documentary was obviously the story as a whole, man. The fact that you went through such Thank tragedy. You, yeah, man, the fact Thank that you went through such a traumatic, I mean, it's such a traumatic story and the fact that you were able to come out of it, obviously, in this like really Appreciate wonderful that. way, man. So, I mean, I wonder, since obviously we're on this topic of being a motivational speaker, how do you see it now? Like, through what lens do you see your life? especially kind of those early years? You know, the early years, I, I look at life, everything happened for a reason. Yeah. Um, and I look at everything that I went through was a learning experience for me. And I don't really regret anything because it happened. It was written for me. I don't agree with certain things, but at the end of the day, I said God written it for me for a reason. Yeah. Um, if anything, I could walk away with, uh, you know, a, a lesson, a learning lesson from it, you know? And I don't. I try not to raise my kids the way that I was raised. I try to let them know straight up, this is not the life, and that's all we can do is try our best. And I try my best to lead by example. I'm not perfect. I have many mistakes, many shortcomings, yeah. but I try my best to lead by example so that my kids can say, well, if my daddy telling me to do that, at least he's the first one trying to do it. And if he make a mistake, we know none of us is perfect. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so, and in terms of being a motivational speaker, and just obviously a father, and just a role model for people all over, all around the world, what sort of lessons do you think are the most important to impart? The type of lessons um, that's most important that we try to. to yeah. Good question, man. I think it's important to let the people, especially teenagers, that they're going to make some mistakes. Yeah. And um, so it's important to let them know that you're going to make some mistakes, but try your best to avoid as many mistakes as possible. You know what I mean? And like someone used to told me, man, it's easy to get in trouble, but it's hard to get out of it. Mm -hmm. Because I know that mindset as a youngster, especially as 17, 18, 20, 21, you, you think that you're on top of the world, you think you're untouchable, you think you know it all. And it's important that I tell you, man, listen to your parents, because it's a, it's a high chance that when your parents say we've been there and done that, they really been there and done that. Yeah. And they really want good for you. You know what I mean? They really was there before you, and they and they and they trying to speak to, from experience. So you know, I always tell the people you're gonna make mistakes. You know what I mean? That that comes with the life. That comes with life. You know what I mean? But bounce back and try not to continue on that same path. You know, and it ain't worth it. You know what I mean? If you can get a head start on on a positive note, on a positive path, get that head start. You know what I mean? Yeah, man, and that's what I loved about your poem, My Life, man. It's like you're pretty much trying to convey that message. It sort of not only obviously sure. that every, everything happens for a reason, but it seems like like we all kind of have in the beginning of our lives, obviously because our brains aren't kind of fully formed, right? We make these terrible sure. mistakes sometimes, and like we really need role models. And I think Real we, talk. yeah, man, and I think we talked about this on the show a while ago that the, yeah. it feels like our yeah. culture as a whole, right? You know, kind of speaking and touching on fame and sort of what we look toward or what we sort of appreciate about society as a culture for a whole. I feel as a whole, I feel yeah, like sure. we're really missing like really important so like really important role sure. models people that we can really actually kind of look up to and say like this is the sort of epitome of what a person any human being is supposed to be exactly bro exactly yeah yeah, yeah you know we got to try to especially those who are in a, in a, in a, in a position of influence is very important now 
with social media and stuff like that, you can reach millions and hundreds of thousands just by one post. So it's very important to try to be careful and mindful of what we post, you know what I mean? And you do have some celebrities that trying their best, you know what I mean? So more respect to them. Isn't that amazing, though? Mm. I, I love that sure. because it's something we never had before. And actually, sure. if you got that that quality that people, you know, resonate with and you're, pu- you're putting out like a, such a good message, then that exactly. could really change the world, especially if there's all these other people doing it, too. And then like, exactly. yeah, and then like, it, I, I wonder what's going to be what it's going to be like in like 10 years, let's say from now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you never know, man. That, we, we, God willing, we're around to see, you know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, and Napoleon, in terms of your own message, right, and kind of what we look at as resilience. So if somebody went through something similar to what you did, and they were obviously in that situation, and they kind of felt hopeless, and their life had no meaning, how would you sort of define resilience to them? And what would you tell them that they sort of, what, what, would, what is it that, how would you kind of instill hope in them? I think, man, one, I would tell them, man, to keep a, a strong relationship with your creator, with God, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? There's nothing great, nothing too great, nothing too, nothing that he cannot do. You know what I mean? Nothing that nothing lasts forever, whether it's good or bad. You, in life, you're going to have ups, you're going to have downs. You know what I mean? So when you're having some difficulty days, for sure it won't last forever. You know what I mean? And I, I try my best to, you know, remind the people that because I, I witnessed that. You know what I mean? I witnessed parts of my life where I thought that I hit rock bottom and I thought that this was it for me. And I know with just being patient and uh, perseverance that eventually I got over it. So, I, you know, the main goal, man, don't give up. You know what I mean? Don't give up. That's the main goal because it will get better. You know what I mean? Eventually, God willing. And I would also even add to open up to your community. So something, another thing that we focus on in the show is how important is community to sort of not only dealing with trauma, but just any sort of struggle or heartache. So for another thing, right? So we're kind of missing role models in our culture, but we're also missing a strong sense of community. So obviously, you know more than anybody living in America at one time, right? We're super individualistic here, man. And it's like people are just out for themselves and they're like, you know, we don't really care. If you can help me, fine. But outside of that, like, we don't really band together as a tribe to help one another. And that's so wild that that's yeah. It's something that's so kind of so ingrained in human nature. Exactly. Unfortunately, you know, I, I know growing up at I like I seen a video the other day with Jay Prince put up mm-hmm. some young dudes in Texas, like literally beating up a grandmother trying to take robber. Like wow. when I saw that, I was like, wow. You know what I mean? I, I, I would have never thought because we had rules, we had codes, even though growing up we were some bad dudes growing up but there were some things we cannot do in the hood and get by with it like mm-hmm. we cannot go and attack just a grown a old lady for no reason because we want to rob her and we beat her up and then walk back down the street like it's okay no the whole hood would be against us so when i see stuff like that i'm like what gave these youngsters the 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 the, the idea where they think that you know what made them think that they can just go harm an old woman and nothing gonna happen and it's because the life the time that we living in right now is no there's no role models. There's nobody putting it down, teaching the youngsters. You know what I mean? There's no OGs. Or there's no real OGs in some parts of America, unfortunately. You know what I mean? Yeah. So when you see stuff like that, man, that, that's that's crazy. Like, I couldn't do that. Like, growing up, we couldn't just beat up people for no reason. If we beat up people for no reason, it was other people who was thugs like us. Yeah. You know what I mean? But if you just like a, walking, a working citizen, man, we gave you a pass. Yeah. You and as a society and as a society, man, we're not even doing much for like the inner cities. So like it seems like sure. whatever wherever it was in the sixties, seventies, eighties, even before then, like nothing's really changed. So I would wonder if maybe for, Yeah, and I wonder for these people if they feel even more hopeless than maybe you guys did at your time. Unfortunately, that's true. But one thing I can really say, man, as an American traveling around the world, mm-hmm. um, Americans have a lot of opportunities. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? They have a lot of opportunity, even though there's a lot of there's a lot of racism. That's still, even though America came a long way, but there's still a lot of racism. There's a lot of the systematic racism going on. But still, there's nothing that's going to stop a person that really want to go get an education and get a degree. For example, if a person go to a community college like there's so many opportunities now, though, that people should take. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I know people, man, I, I got people that's living out here in Saudi Arabia with me that grew up. In the hood, Compton or Jersey grew up the worst of the society, changed their life around when they decided that enough is enough. They went and got degrees and got, you know, degrees and went to university. Now they out here teaching and working. So yeah. I really feel like, you know what I mean? There's a lot of, there's a lot of 
things against people in the hood in America, but also there's a lot of opportunities. You know what I mean? Nothing stopping some, no one, nothing is stopping a youngster getting up and say, you know what, I want to go to college. You can apply for what is it, a student loan, or you can apply for a grant. Like yeah. there's many opportunities that you can get up and say, I'm going to get this degree and start my own business. Or you know what I mean? So yeah. can't really sit down and blame. Like I, ain't, I, I'm not with all that anymore. Where. No doubt about it. It, it. It's some stuff, systematic racism that happened in America. Yeah. But I don't have that mindset where I say the white man is holding me down. Like how they, yeah, <laughs> I don't, yeah, yeah. I don't agree with all that. You know what I mean? Because I'm the type of person I just get up and wash cars to make some money. Like it, it's always a way. Like I hustle. Yeah. You know what I mean? Nobody's stopping you from getting up out of the house and or walking out of your door and go doing something. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I'm that type. I'm old school with it, man. So, yeah, so honestly, uh, you, you, know, you know how like a second ago we were like, oh, there's no role models or there's not enough? I don't know if I agree with that. Like what you're saying right now, yeah. that's a, that's, that's li you're literally a, being a role model right now. If, Appreciate that, man. Yeah, Appreciate so, that. But society doesn't, you got to understand the role models that most of us want in our inner cities is the role models who the society blasts on television or to, to have most of it have a negative um, aura around it, unfortunately, you know what I mean? Yeah. You don't really have too many people that's out really trying to teach the kids positivity. Like a lot of the rappers and so on, they still talking about selling drugs and these type of things, and they not selling drugs anymore. Yeah. A lot of them making money off of rap music, starting businesses. When you gonna hear people talk, teaching kids how to be entrepreneurs, you know what I mean? Like you made it out of the hood, you probably sold a couple million records or whatever, streams or whatever, I'm old school, I don't know how they do it now, but and then you got into business. Share that opportunity with someone else. Share that knowledge with someone else so that they can make it. You know what I mean? I think that's important. But I read something today where they say one out of two African Americans are actually middle class now, middle class and above. Yeah, so yeah. it shows that, you know what I mean? I read that. I don't know how true it is, but CNN said it. You know what I mean? I don't know. Trump would call it fake news, but <laughs> there, was <a> lot of, <laughs> yeah. there was a lot of stats behind it where it showed that, you know, the African Americans, and I believe a majority of, of african-american women are in college now so they taking advantage not just african-american any people you got blacks you got whites you got latinos that all live in poverty in america it's not just for the african-americans but people that's living in poverty have an opportunity to go get a degree go get some education and hustle because yeah. one thing you one thing i realized traveling around the world with an american passport and a degree you can get on a plane and go anywhere and get a job yeah. You might not find you might not be you might not find what you want in America, but if you go to anywhere else in the country and say this in the world and say I have American passport, I have this degree, most people around the world, most companies around the world would love to have an American working for them. Yeah. Honestly. You know what I mean? So a lot's earth is spacious, man. <laughs> <laughs> and do you feel like outside of America the racism is different? Do you feel like kind of like racism? For sure. Yeah, it is, right? For sure. Yeah, for sure. Racism is definitely I haven't really um you know what, growing up in America, I know about racism, hands down. I never faced any direct face-to-face -face racism. Nobody never looked at me and called me a racist yeah. remark or anything like that. You know what I mean? I never, but of course, growing up in the hood, we experienced one way or another. You know what I mean? The majority of the times that I experienced it, it always been the shady type, not direct, indirect. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, I think European countries are... Um, I've seen some weird stuff happen, especially amongst the Muslims there. Like the Muslims that come from North Africa and West Africa that go to 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 the UK or go to Europe, go to France, the racism there is almost oppression. Yeah. You know, I mean? they still treat it like second class citizens. Like they still cannot come up. So when I go back to America and you see like African Americans, or, you know, owning businesses, judges, um, police chiefs, for example, I'm just saying, mm -hmm. you don't see that in London. You don't really see like, can I go into a a, a place in London and see a black CEO? I don't really see that. Yeah. Or can I go to France and see? So it's, it, it, it let us know that America did come a long way. You know what I mean? Because definitely Europeans, they still behind in some stuff, man. Yeah, wow. Sure. Do you think it's just like a matter of time before things start getting better? Like, do you think there's hope? Like, I, I tend to think that thing, I mean, if we're just talking about America, I think things yeah. are a little better than they used to be. And it Yeah, yeah. I, I think America came a long way, no, no doubt about it. I think everyone can really... Um, vouch for that you know what i mean america came a long way you still got some you still got some lunatics you know what i mean you still yeah. got some racism going on but it did come a long way um especially i'm talking from the race from the race standpoint of view that it did come a long way you feel me so but you know what i mean it, every nation had problems you know what i mean no place on earth is 
is is perfect, you know. But I can definitely say America came a long way, hands down. Yeah, and something that I thought that was important that you said earlier was about sort of bringing people together and kind of using the stuff that um, their kind of accomplishments to sort of share them with other people. So interestingly, so we had this really great guest on last week. Her name is Amy Von Dursen. So she's an existential yeah. philosopher and psychotherapist. And so she says yeah. when it comes to fame and when it comes to sort of greed and hogging that fame, that people kind of sort of not only isolate themselves but make themselves depressed in that sort of fame bubble. And so uh-huh. what that actually got me thinking, right, about how obviously you met Pac and how Pac was like, nah, like this is somebody that we need on our team, right? So, and yeah, for me, yeah. I was like, yes, like that actually makes sense because for him, he understood that fame wasn't something that he was supposed to hog, that for him, community sure. was important and that he had to sort of bring it to you guys because not only obviously you guys had a message, but he needed y'all. And what was so cool, sure, sure. yeah, man, and what was so cool about the Outlaws is I felt like all of you individually had a really good message that without one yeah. another, I'm not so sure that you guys would have been as successful, which is a good thing, right? I agree, yeah, which is yeah. a good thing. And, and, and and when I look back at it, Pop really tried to um, shelter us from fame. Like yeah. he hated that. He hated for us to get on the camera. He hated for us to like be in videos. Like he wanted us to just be like his goon rappers mm-hmm. that stay away from this fame. He like look at like if we all in the camera, he like look at y'all, man. Y'all y'all chasing that fame is gonna destroy y'all. You know what I mean? He was talking that back then. <laughs> wow. How come he was so you know against I mean? that? Because it seems like he did like I'm the spotlight. Sure. You know, he's always called success success. Wow. Success, I mean, success. Yeah. He said, you know, uh, we made it to the success. He said it's sickening. Wow. And if you look back about it, man, success in that point of that from that point of view, like fame and and that type of life, it is sickening. You know what I mean? Like you mentioned, people commit suicide. It's a sickening environment because it's 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 like a mirage. Everybody have to be who the others want, the people they want you to be. You cannot really be yourself. You know what I mean? So it's a sickening environment that. You, and in order to make it, you have to compromise so much. Yeah. You know what I mean? You have to compromise so much. And a lot of people, and when you hear people saying they sell their soul, I'm not sure if people literally sell their soul, but I'm sure. Don't get me wrong. I'm sure you might find those cases as well. But most people sell their soul without them even knowing. Without yeah. them even knowing. Gradually. You know what I mean? Gradually. You would see them doing things that they came into the industry saying that they would never do. But once that money started piling up and they feel like they need some more, it's hard for them to say no. It's hard for them to walk away from things. So most people will put their morals to the side just for money. And you yeah. see that happen to the best of them. You know what I mean? Looking back on it, do you feel like kind of success symbolizes or represents shackles or a form of them? I think it is, definitely. Yeah. I think a lot of people, they, 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 they fail to realize. They think just because you're making a lot of money doesn't mean you're actually free. Doesn't yeah. mean you're not a slave. You know what I mean? So they, they think that because now that then we're on television, we make millions of dollars that we actually, you know, you're a slave to something. If you're not a slave to your creator or the one who created you, you're a slave to something. You know what I mean? So most of the people, they like, they, they slaves. They slave to the industry. They're going to do what the people tell them to do in order to bring that money. Um, what, what, what we call it? Chattel slavery. I call it chattel slavery. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so what does freedom look like to you? Freedom is that you worship in your creator and you free from you free from the misconception or you free from the what the society wants you to believe is the norm. You yeah. understand? Mm-hmm. Like if you free, like for example, I felt a taste of freedom when I said, you know what, I'm gonna walk away from the music industry. I'm gonna worship my creator. I don't care what the people say about me. I'm gonna dress this way. I don't care what the people say about me. Wallahi, I felt that freedom. You know what I mean? I felt freedom that I never knew existed. You yeah. know what I mean? I don't have to worry about the, 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 the newest car. I don't have to worry about that now. I'm not trying to get a car because the, the next person that sees me is going to say, wow, you got that type of car. Like, you're a slave to, to praise. Some people just a slave to reaction of people praising them. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, as I said, man, if you're not a, a slave to your creator, the one who created you, then you're going to be a slave to something. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, we talk about that on the show, actually, um, about ego, you know, how people get really attached to certain ideas or ways they have to be or what society sure. tells them, you know? For and sure, like, yes. Yeah, and uh, honestly, I think that's the biggest, um, the biggest, like the greatest enemy, you know, as far as yeah, like, it uh, is. yeah, mankind, because you know, we were talking about uh, pride before, right? And For sure. I was thinking like, yeah, it kind of goes along with that. Like, that's the biggest like if you could beat that, of then, course, then that's and that's, that's hard. The freedom. And that's hard, man. Pride, no matter what you are, no matter what religion, no matter what race, pride is something 
you can never get rid of it. You just gotta you just gotta know how to conquer it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because pride is something that we have in us. It's like it's part of our DNA. But you just gotta know when to let it. Like for example, I say to myself, I I I went from a type of person. If a person look at me the wrong way. And I'm not saying it like I'm a big gangster, but the outlaws will tell you if a person look at me the wrong way, say something to me the wrong way, then my reaction back then might it will hurt my pride that who this person think he talking to. Yeah. We have to fight. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm at a point in my life now that if a person might say something to me, I can be like, you know what? I don't give a hell what they say. As long as he ain't putting his hand on me, he can say and think what he want. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But as long as he don't put his hand on me, he can say all what he want. He can do what he want. You know what I mean? I, I, I want my freedom. But pride is a very difficult thing to master and conquer, bro. Many of us get ourselves in trouble in that. Even myself to this day sometimes. You know what I mean? So you just got to know how to conquer it or try our best. You know what I mean? No, yeah. There's, there's a wisdom to that. Because uh, there's this saying that I always go back to. Like whenever I can, I'm not perfect with it. But uh, yes. if you think you have problems, go get bigger ones, right? Like, for wow. example, yeah, like, wow. if the, and also there's a saying like, uh, um, what is it? The size of the man is the size of his problems. So anytime I caught myself like reacting to something like, yeah, and yeah. if you really thought about it was petty, I'd be like, for shit, sure. okay, I'm, I'm making a mistake here. And then it kind of snaps <laughs> me out of it, you know? That's smart, man. You gotta, you gotta have that type of balance, real talk, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, and it's so wild how, like, reality just as a whole seems like one big illusion. Like, people sort of lust after fame and success, and they don't really know what it's like when they get it. Exactly, man. And fame, like, I always tell the people when they say, what can I do to get into music? I say, take it. Stay away from it. Because I don't really have no good memories other than just kicking it with the homies. Yeah. You know what I mean? Other than that, what's the good memories? You know what I mean? They, they It's just a crook, corrupt industry. I remember I met with this lawyer, and... Um, he was saying how one of his artists, they was robbing millions of dollars from his his um, his royalties. And he was like, look, man, the music industry make the biggest mafia yeah. look like choir boys. Damn, He's man. like, because there's so many corrupt people behind it. The judge is with this person. When you want to sue this person, this person call this DA and this person call this lawyer. This person call this judge. Yeah. Everybody work together. Everybody get a piece to be quiet. He's like, man, like... This is the only industry where a person can rob a person for twenty, thirty million dollars and don't go to jail. Yep. Yeah. And you know what's so you know wild? What I mean? and I, yeah. And I never understood that. So how is it that like artists, literally the people who are producing the work, right? How is it that the artists are the ones who are kind of subservient to these record industry execs who like literally do nothing creative? Like they're just exactly. That's it. Like and now that like obviously rappers and other musicians are coming out with their own labels. I mean, we kind of realize yeah. that these business execs are never needed. That they're like nobody. Exactly. They, they never nobody. So it's the only industry that they could steal 30, 20, 30, whatever millions from you. Yeah. And they have no consequences. They have their own law. Well, you signed this over. You did this. The statue of, Liber- the statue of limitation ran out. This is crazy. It's crazy, bro. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? What do you think it would have been like if Pac actually started Machiavelli Records? I think for him it would have been... He would have been the first one to do it big, you mm-hmm. know what I mean? What you see now with these Jay Z's and Rockefeller, he would have been the first one to do it. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? He would have been the first one for sure. What was his plan? Like, what did he want? His to plan do? was, you know, he never really talked too much on the business side of it. We just knew that he used to come to us and say, "Suge Knight want to sign y'all," but I told him no because y'all gonna be my first artist on Machiavelli Record. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I'm gonna do Machiavelli Records under Death Row Records. We're gonna release soon. Y'all gonna be the first artist. So I do know. He was going to have a distribution deal with Defo Records, Machiavelli Records under it, and we was going to be his first artist signed on and release on it, you know? Yeah. Damn, man, that would have been yeah. so cool if that happened. Yeah, man, everything happened for a reason, though. You I, know? Hear <laughs> I hear you. So, I mean, do you have any good memories of the music industry or just like, I don't know, make it records and obviously going on tour? I really don't, man. I really don't have no good. Other than, like I said, just yeah. when I think of anything good, I think about sitting in the living room with Pac watching television, joking, that's the only, th- and that's sad. Yeah. It's a good thing, good memories, but it's sad that I can say from that industry, the only thing that I can take, po- and, and it's not about the money, I, I made a lot of money yeah. in the music industry, but during that th- during that time of me making all that money, I was the most depressed and unhappy in, in my life, you know what I mean? I lost Pop, we lost Gaddafi, I lost the, the people that was close to me from the city, we lost Fatal, yeah. you know, even though he, he died years later, but... We lost Pac, we lost Gaddafi, people that was close to us. So it was just, it was bitter for me. After that, I think it became bitter. You know? 
I mean, well, for me and from my kind of perspective, your music has always meant a lot to me. And it kind of came to me at a difficult time in my life when I was kind of growing up and when I needed something, right? And I, I mean, I talked about yeah. it a lot that I identify with Pac and I identify with you guys and your yeah. stories. And I was just wondering, I mean, yeah. do, is there, thank you, man. And is there anything that you feel like your fans should take away from your music, the ones who still listen to it or the ones who maybe you would want to still listen to it? I really don't know, man, because I know my music back then. My mindset changed now. You know I what I mean? I know for some people they might say it was a lot of positive stuff, but my I music think so. was filled with, you know, thank you. I, I think we did have some positive messages, no doubt about it, but I yeah. think a lot of it was filled with stuff that I wouldn't want people to do drinking and, yeah. you know, fornicating and call it the crazy stuff. Yeah. So it's hard for me to say go ahead and do it, you know what I mean? Because yeah. my mindset is different than back then, you know what I mean? I hear you. Well, I mean, the two songs that stand out to me in terms of a positive message, and literally, like, two of my favorites are Just Like Daddy and The Good Die Young. Yeah, 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 they were definitely positive. You know what I mean? They were definitely positive lyrics. And I think we did try our best to be positive and try to do it from a standpoint of view that the the people in our neighborhood and and our communities can relate to it, you know? For sure. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, You know, there was this part you mentioned before um, uh, where you're like, uh, where you hit rock bottom right yes do you think that when that is what pushed you to try looking at things a different way like it that's it took getting to rock bottom to like then decide okay i need some other way of looking at things or looking at life you know actually um i i didn't really i hit rock bottom after i became muslim oh wow you know what i mean before that i was um I think what led me to start searching for something else is when I got to the point where I started, like, I had houses. I had maybe three, four, like, I was living a good life. I had brand new cars, you know what I mean? Money, jewelry. But every night I would go to sleep, I was depressed and I was unhappy. And I start questioning myself, like, this cannot be what I thought the so-called um, fame, the life of fame or the so-called American dream would be. Like, how come I have this house, four or five bedroom home? Yeah. But I'm very depressed. I'm very unhappy. So... When I became Muslim and I walked away from everything, that's when the real test started coming. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And um, that's when I hit rock bottom and I was able to, you know, work myself back up by the permission of God. And I was able, and I look at that as a lesson also because it let me know who was really in my corner. And you know what I mean? Like the people that was that I thought was friends, that it, it revealed a lot. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. it revealed a lot of, of different people and also myself that I was able to look. Man, I went through this, and that was a t- that was a time that everybody thought I was crazy. My brother wasn't Muslim back then. Most of my friends wasn't Muslim. They used to say, man, this dude lost his mind. Look at him. I'm, now a lot of them accepted his lot and mm-hmm. they understand what I was going through. But it was a tough time that I appreciate that time. You know what I mean? Yeah, it was a real test of character. Because like you, you knew sure. you had to do this. And then uh, yeah. other people, they couldn't understand. And even sure. that's a test. Because you see them not understanding. And it like makes yeah. you question, you know, like, uh, exactly. Everybody yeah. looking at me like, man, this guy's nuts. Why you don't do this? Why you don't do this anymore? Not that I change overnight, you know what I mean? It, it, it was gradually steps. It was steps that I gradually had to take to change. But it was a learning lesson experience. And I think a lot of my family and friends later on in life, they was able to understand what I went through. And um, you know what I mean? I had to keep it stepping, bro. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know? <laughs> and where do you see your poetry going? You know, I'm going to test the waters with it. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? I, it was something that I was thinking about doing for years. And I felt like now was the proper time. Like, I've been thinking about it for years. You know what I mean? It's not like I just woke up one day and said, let me do it. You mm-hmm. know, most of the people from the outside looking in might, you know, believe that. But, you know what I mean? I just want to test the waters with it. You know, and see what I can do. See the reaction of the people. See the type of message that I can put out. And see where we go from there, you know? Yeah, man. That's really cool. And so, what Thank is motivational you, speaking like? Motivational speaking, I, I love it. You know, yeah. traveling around the world, talking to different people, different communities. I'm able to, some of my talks might be about entrepreneurship. Some might mm-hmm. be talking about, like, you know, some of the challenges facing in the, in the communities. Um, it, it's amazing, man, because I'm not, I'm not, I'm the type of person that I speak from my heart. Like, mm-hmm. I don't really go with a pen in the pad and try, I just try to, I, I can look at the crowd and I can say, you know what? This crowd seemed like this. It seemed like they understand this. Let me make my topic towards that and try my best to, re- to just get it out there. You know what I mean? And and I enjoy it, man. You know, meeting different people, traveling around the world, and some people coming up. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Explaining to me what they took from it. So it's a beautiful thing. Oh, that's but brothers, I got I got to go to the prayers now. It's prayer time. I hear you, man. Thank you so so <laughs> much for pleasure, coming man. on, man. This was so awesome.
for sure, man. And let me know what's up. You know, hit me up and send me the one minute link so I can uh, can market and promote. Yeah, man, absolutely. Thank you so much, man. So, for is sure. there anything you want? Thank you. Is there anything you want the audience to know before we go? One last thing. Email. Go check out my documentary that's out, Life of an Outlaw, Amazon, Google. Go check out the poem. You know what I mean? The poem is on YouTube under my YouTube page, Muta Build TV. We also have it on iTunes, um, Apple Store, Google. You can download it, listen to it in your car without any music. Chill it. You All know right. what I mean? So appreciate this, man. And we'll do it again, man. Absolutely, man. Yeah, Thank man. you so much, Thanks, man. man. Thank you, man. All, All right. right. Peace. 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 <laughs> <laughs> All right, wow, that was awesome. That was a really great episode. All right, wow, I'm like on cloud nine. All right, guys, and so before we go, we just wanted to say that you can check us out at O4LOnlineNetwork.com. You can follow Seize the Moment podcast there. You can follow our guy, Vegas Media Designs, who pretty much takes care of all of the visuals Mm -hmm. from our videos to like every sort of form of artwork that we do. He pretty much does all of it for us. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you can check out the other staff member at O4L Online who has like phenomenal stories on kind of Tupac's life, just the music industry as a whole. He interviews different sort of artists and um, authors his name is Andy O4L and you can find Andy on Twitter on Facebook and on Instagram and and yeah uh, remember we're at Seize the Moment Podcast on Facebook and Instagram and at Seize underscore podcast on Twitter Mm -hmm. Uh, remember to subscribe hit the bell bell, Uh and we'll see you next time and for next time we have Keith Frankishon so we're going to be talking about the illusion of consciousness next week so look forward to that see you guys next time take care